We're wrapping up our series today on our Father's house. And this has been a series we're talking about uh, different themes in Scripture about how the Lord builds His house, where uh, in His church, where His presence dwells. And in particular, we've been doing a deep dive on our new mission statement that was adopted earlier this year. And so uh, let's read this together one more time, okay? The mission of Stillwater Church is to partner with Jesus by raising up a family of disciples who dwell in the presence of God and offer their lives as a testimony to the world. Amen. All right, well, there is a progression in this mission statement that is very intentional. We started off week one and we talked about this, but it starts with uh, this, uh, this priority of partnering with Jesus because he is the head of the church, the scripture says, and our main job is just to get on his agenda. Amen? And then the statement moves on to summarize in modern language basically what Jesus did. He raised up a family of disciples. That's what we see actually at the birthplace of the church in Acts that we've been studying together. How does the church start? It starts with a family of disciples who had decided to follow Jesus. That's how the whole thing gets going. And then the last two lines, we started to talk about this last week, really are a description of what disciples do. What does a disciple of Jesus look like? What is God's intention for his people who come to him through Jesus Christ? And, and, and we say, first of all, they're people who, who learn to dwell in the presence of God. Why do we start there? Well, because this is God's primary motivation in creation. God created a people that they might be with him, that he might share his love with them, his life with them. You, you hear this cry throughout the whole of Scripture. You will be my people and I will be your God, the Lord said. And this is, this is his heartbeat. And this is at the heart of the temple ministry and the ministry of the priests in the Old Testament, making a place where God's presence may dwell with his people. That's what you see through the whole text. And this is ultimately what Jesus accomplished on the cross and with his resurrection. As a perfect sacrificial lamb, he tore apart the curtain that separated us from the Holy of Holies, and he opened up the way for us to actually dwell in God's presence, to live into God's intention for creation from the very beginning. Ultimately, we see the climax of this in his promise then, which comes to pass where he sends the Holy Spirit. And now we get to be God's temple, not just a physical building, but his people will dwell in his presence as they carry his actual spirit with them everywhere that they go. This is the blessing of being adopted into God's family by the blood of Jesus. And so that's why we start, when we start to describe what we mean to, as a family of disciples, we start with this place, who dwell in the presence of God, because that is God's heartbeat for creation. But that's not all there is to it. When you look at the scriptures, the invitation of God is not just to personally experience his goodness and his presence through Christ. From the first pages to the very end, we also see God doing something else. In fact, go with me. We're going to go back to the beginning of your Bible, Genesis chapter 12. It's called the Abrahamic Covenant. And I'm going to read the first two verses in chapter 12. Listen to this. The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land I will show you. This is, this is the place, this is the beginning place of the Israelite people. He's calling out Abraham, okay? And this is what he says. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This is always the plan of God. I will bless you, but not just for yourself, that you might be a blessing. This is the way God works. Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. I'm going to take you to the promised land. I'm going to, the scripture says, I'm going to make your children outnumber the stars. But it's not just for you, Abraham. It's to bless all nations. It's to show all nations. It's, it's to provide a testimony to all nations of what it looks like. When God and his people dwell together. And that's where the last line of this mission statement comes in. The invitation of a disciple of Jesus is not just to dwell in his presence, but also then to offer our very lives that others may come to know him too. This doesn't just stop in the Old Testament. Actually, 
this, this theme is pervasive in all of the scriptures. For example, uh, if you flip over the New Testament in, in Mark's gospel, look at Mark chapter 1, verse 16. It's the very first place where Jesus calls out disciples to come and follow him. And this is what it says. It says, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Listen, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Notice how this plays out. This is word one to the disciples. Ready? The invitation is to follow him, which is the invitation to, to dwell with him, to live life with him, to be with him. Right? That's, that's the first part. But that invitation is coupled with an intention to send them out and to reach others. You see how that's embedded from, from word one? Come and dwell, send and go. This is always the movement of God's people. Flip over to Mark chapter 3, you see it again. Mark 3 verse 13, Jesus is calling the disciples to himself and it says, Jesus went up to the mountainside, he called those to him that he wanted and they came to him. Verse 14, he appointed 12, what, what did he appoint them to do? Listen, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. They might be with him, send them out to preach. What is, this, what is that saying? Disciples learn to dwell in the presence of God and then are sent out to offer their lives as a testimony to the world. So this two-part sort of heart of God is embedded all throughout the world, all throughout the scripture. Relationship and mission. Worship, testimony. Identity, outreach. These always go together. Now, I do want to acknowledge the way that we've worded this uh, in the mission statement. It's actually, um, it's pretty strong, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of some intense language when you really listen to it. They offer our lives? That sounds hard. That sounds, um, that actually, that sounds costly. That sounds sacrificial. And we said it that way because that's exactly what Jesus invites us to do. The life that we really long for, whether we realize it or not, is actually only found in a place of self-sacrificial living. Think back to Paul's famous words in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, he says. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Living sacrifice. Someone once said, the problem with living sacrifices is that they're always trying to crawl off the altar. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Laying down our desires, offering ourselves fully for the Lord's use, it is hard. It is sacrificial. And yet that is the calling. That's the invitation of discipleship. When Jesus called the disciples, he said things like this. If anyone would come after me, he must first pick up his cross daily and follow me. That doesn't sound like fun. But the invitation of of discipleship to follow him is in fact an invitation to offer your very life. But here's the good news. This isn't, this isn't burdensome news. This is actually good news because on the other side of death to self is actually real life. It's the way the gospel works. On the other side of death to self is also the kind of life that God can use as a testimony to the world. This week I was talking to a woman from our, our church who has a, just, I hadn't, hadn't heard all the details before. It's a powerful testimony of transformation. Not that many years ago, she was in a place where she should have been dead multiple times. She found herself living on the streets due to drug addiction. And it was a simple prayer of desperation one night calling on the name of Jesus that eventually led her to total transformation. It led her down a path of abandonment to all that she had pursued at that point in her life. The path that had her on the way of death. And the death to her old life opened up the possibility of what she now experiences with Jesus, which is a brand new life. A 
And now, I just, her every breath is a testimony to the Lord's goodness. Yeah, every response to Jesus requires sacrifice, but it's always worth it. That's the thing. It's always worth it. There's a famous missionary named Jim, Jim Elliott who actually died on the mission, mission field sharing his faith. And he said these words. I love this quote. He said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Think about that. It's a beautiful, eternal perspective here. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. All the stuff that we put into it. To gain what he cannot lose. The beautiful invitation of Jesus is to come and to be with God. To dwell in his presence. To experience the goodness and the very relationship for which you were created. And then, to not just keep it to ourselves, but rather to share that goodness as a testimony to the world. By word and by deed by the gospel that we proclaim, and by the transformed lives that we live and serve in the world. We offer ourselves as a living sacrifice that the world may say, even if just in a glimpse, even if just in a small way, that they may see our lives and know the goodness of God. The mission of Snowwater Church is to partner with Jesus by raising up a family of disciples who dwell in the presence of God and offer their lives Friends, this, um, I was thinking about this this week, this, this vision, not these particular words, but this vision of the Christian life, to dwell in God's presence and offer him to the world, is, that's, a, that's a vision that I'm prepared to die for. I hope it's not physically, <laughs> although if it be necessary, I trust that God will give me the strength. But I'm willing to die my own hopes and dreams, my own desires and longings, that God may reveal himself to the world through us in this way. I'm going to close with this. About a year and a half ago, I am, right after Easter, right after Pastor John had been appointed to another church, we did a sermon series on the first few books of, of Joshua. I don't know if you remember that at all. We talked about the promised land. We talked about this moment when the Israelites come right up to the Jordan River and actually the instruction the Lord gave them is to step foot into the water, the flooded waters, before he parts uh, the Jordan and then trust him to do the miraculous and then he'll go on the cross. So remember the instruction is consecrate yourself for the Lord is about to do amazing things among you. Now step in the water. Take a step. I was thinking about that this week, and I, and I thought, you know, I was thinking about this, this line to offer our lives as testimony to the world, and I thought, you know, God wants to lead all of us into a sort of promised land, one where we learn to dwell with him every day. This is the invitation of the life of Christ, where we, we dwell with him every day, and then where our lives, just like the Israelites in the Old Testament, are set up as a testimony to the whole But just like the Israelites so many years ago, this invitation also requires consecration, prayer, and risky steps of faith where we're willing to be obedient to the word of the Lord. If I look back with me, I want, I want to look at the very last chapter in Joshua to close. This is in Joshua 24. We didn't get to this, this part when we uh, talked about it a year and a half ago. But I want you to hear what happens. Joshua, at the very end of his life, They've crossed into the promised land. They've crossed over the Jordan. He gathers all the tribes of Israel, and then he recounts their history to them. He reminds them of God's faithfulness. He reminds them of the call to Abraham. He reminds them of Moses and Aaron leading them out of Egypt. He reminds them of the miracles that they'd seen, about when they had crossed the Jordan River, and about God giving them the land. He reminds them of God's relentless faithfulness across generations. But then, at the very end of his life, he brings them up to this present moment where he shares a hard truth, and it's a crossroads moment for them. And he tells them 
that it's time to abandon the idols that they had picked up along the way in the past. That it was time for them to offer their whole lives as a testimony to the world, to offer everything that they had to the Lord, and to hold nothing back. Listen to what he says in Joshua 24. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Listen, he says it so plain. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors serve beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You know, God always leads us to these kind of crossroads moments, doesn't he? Where we have a choice of whether to go our own way or to surrender to his. And there's always a cost to full surrender. There's always something. I think about Jesus, who is the ultimate crossroads in the life of everyone that he encountered. Because every human that encounters him, truly encounters him, has to choose. It happens with the rich young ruler, doesn't it? When, when he comes and he says, I've kept the commandments of my whole life. What else do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, he doesn't say, oh, you're good. Just keep doing your thing, man. No, he says, you know, there's actually, there's one more thing. Sell everything. Everything that you have, and give it to the poor. And the young man goes away sad because he realized the cost. That's that cost is too much for me. You know that is the invitation of Jesus to surrender everything. And so Joshua stands at this sort of prefigure of Jesus. By the way, Jesus uh, in Hebrew is Yeshua, which in English is Joshua. There's an interesting connection here between Jesus and, and Joshua. And Joshua says, just like Jesus later will say, you have to choose. You have to choose. It's up to you. I'm not going to force myself on you. The Lord says, I'm not going to force you. You can come and have all of the abundant life that I designed you for, the kind of life in the promised land where you dwell in the presence of God. You can have this kind of abundant life, which is also the life that proclaims to the world his goodness. You can have all of that, but you cannot have it unless you're willing to abandon the things that you try to put in God's place. You have to choose whether you will lay down your life Many years ago, I came to a crossroads moment in my own life like this. I came face to face with the Lord and I had to choose. Will I go on with my half-hearted Christianity, pastoring a nice church that just does some nice things? Or will I go all in? Will I serve the Lord? No matter if it means quitting my job and becoming a missionary, no matter if it means being misunderstood or having people reject me, no matter what, <clears throat> will I lay down my idols of self-promotion and the approval of men in order to serve the Lord in such a way that perhaps just maybe in some small part, people will see the testimony to the gospel of Christ. As I was praying this week and writing this message, I found myself sort of re-upping on that choice. Say, Lord, you have my all. No matter the cost, no matter what the future holds, you have everything. And all of us have the decision. At some point, you have to choose whether or not you'll lay down your idols for Jesus. At 
some point you have to choose whether or not you step foot into the flooded Jordan for Jesus and, and trust him with the outcome. At some point, you have to choose whether you want your life to be all about yourself or whether you're willing to offer sacrificially to God everything that you have so that he might use you for the sake of him. We call this a series, Our Father's House. Do you know how God builds a house where his presence dwells continually? He builds it out of a group of people who individually and collectively decide that no matter what, as for me and my house, So what I just asked you this morning in a place of self-reflection, will you seek the Lord's presence above all others? Will we offer our lives as a testimony to the world? This is the way of Jesus. As Joshua would say, I think the Lord says to us, choose this day. Would you, would you meet us in the, in the difficulty of that choice? Would you meet us by your spirit in the costliness of this invitation? Would you give us strength by your spirit to lay down all that we have upon your altar? Would you give us faith to believe that the life you would give us on the other side of surrender be worth anything that we have mandated to you here and now. You are good. You are good. And we know you out of all of it. So we give it to you freely today. In Jesus' name.